It's one of my favorite areas to work in is historical fiction. And I think that um, some of the best authors in the genre, they are passionate about getting the history right. Yet they, because it's fiction, they get to put a, a fun twist on the story. They get to take a character into areas that we may not know that they ever really went to or create relationships that may never have really happened. But the, the basis for what went on in the, in the setting, in the place, and in that period have got to be accurate. And then the detail has got to be accurate, whether it's the type of rose that grew in England at that time of year. You're going to have readers that know that. So you need to make sure that all of your details are 100% accurate and let the fiction come into play with the characters and certain situations that happen with them, happen with them, things, relationships you can, depending on who your character is, you can have a fictional twist to. You really have to be careful um, about how you use the fictional elements and make sure that you're grounding them, in fact. But at, at the end of the day, it is fiction. So you do get a certain amount of license when you're you know, setting up a historical novel. Picking a character that will resonate with readers. Um, one of my authors, I'll do an author plug here, Gillian Bagwell wrote The Darling Strumpet, which came out to fantastic reviews. It's about Nell Gwynn. She was an actress in the time of Charles II, just following the Restoration. But she really made Nell come alive because she's passionate about this period and about the theater. And um, it came alive on the page. For readers, I think, from young adult age all the way to, you know, adult, much, much older. So I think being able to sort of tell stories like that where you sort of learn something and you get to get in the head of this really interesting woman um, is what has made the book so appealing to people. For most of our history, um, the, the stories that we have are the stories of great men doing great things. And in fact, uh, in, in reality, it's to the victor goes not only the spoils, but also the ability to tell the story. And so that's top down. That's what history is, has been, uh, which is the stories of the, of the great men doing great things. Uh, about 7,500 years ago, uh, people began looking at, wait a minute, how did these events uh, affect ordinary citizens? And, um, what was their experience? How did it affect their lives in an everyday basis? And so that's bottom-up storytelling. Um, Top-down history is, is primarily a recitation of facts and events, uh, accomplishments. Uh, bottom-up storytelling is looking at the human heart through the lens of a certain time period. One of my favorite TV shows when I was a kid was A Passion Project by Walter Cronkite. Most people think of him as a news guy, but he really was a history buff. And so he created this show called You Are There. And it involved actors reenacting historical moments, whether it was um, the founding fathers in, in the room signing, pledging their lives and their fortunes to start this new country, or Washington crossing the Delaware, all, all, all kinds of events. So the actors would be playing out the scene and the reporters would stand in front of the camera and report what was going on. And the idea was to bring you into that historical moment and have you feel like you were there. And so my objective in writing historical fiction is to take the reader, have the reader have the same experience, feel like you have been dropped into 1951 during the rampage by the Ku Klux Klan in Florida, 1954 when, um, when the whole state was having a cardiac arrest over the idea of uh, integrating the schools, or 1962 when we became an armed state practically overnight by all the military movement and troops and armaments and everything that just pretty much took over the state that week. So my intention is to take you and drop you into that period and have you feel what it was like to be there. If you love history, if you love to read uh, historical fiction and you like to learn things about history, uh, then 
then you're probably a good candidate. If you're, if you love, if you hate research, if you're impatient and you want to get the book done right away or write your story and be done with it, you're probably not a good candidate because um, writing historical fiction it takes longer than a lot of books. These these authors who can turn a book out in a year, I envy them, but uh, I'm very proud of the amount of effort and energy that goes into my work, so I'm more of a tortoise than a hare. I'm willing to invest the time uh, and the energy that it takes to turn out a great piece of historical fiction. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, I, I feel like it may last longer than, than a popular novel. There are other things, though, for tips for people who are writing historical fiction or even religious fiction, is you should think outside the box. You don't want to just rely on your library. You want to develop a pretty good library, but you, you know, you, magazines, books, you know, keep digging, uh, keep adding to what you find, uh, the internet, but you also should think about other places, museums. I found some wonderful information at different museums. Uh, zoos, believe it or not. You know, this is a whole world you're creating with animals. So you need to know what kind of animals, uh, wildlife, you know, live there. Uh, I learned about, for example, the Death Stalker scorpion. And, you know, got online, looked at some places, talked to some people who were uh, etymological experts about the Death Stalker scorpion. Um, other resources are botanical gardens. You know, your world has vegetation in it. So go to your botanical garden. When I wanted to know about a particular uh, plant that was used as a drug, I actually called the Desert Botanical Gardens here in Arizona. I think the other thing you should think about is you can also get bogged down in research. I mean, I see people who write historical fiction or who write, you know, religious fiction either even, and they get so worried about getting everything right that they just kind of never get beyond that. So what you need to do is start writing at a point when you can write a scene or a chapter without having to look anything up. And then if you start to hit little points where you don't know something, just flag it and come back to it later because if you've built up that library and those resources, you'll be able to find it when you start looking. You'll discover that there are certain resources that you always go back to. And as for my own research uh, experience, there was one other thing that proved to be incredibly invaluable is I ended up having a historical expert an expert in first century uh, Palestine, go back and review the entire book, not once, but twice. And when I had questions, I was firing them off to him. Now, my publisher was gracious enough to pay him to do that. But you can find historical experts. I found him, not the publisher, by looking for Google, New Testament, first century New Testament experts. I found three people who had been interviewed by NPR. And then I just went, dug up their emails and their phone numbers and called them and he was the person I ended up with. So it is possible to find experts. Also go to your academia. Don't forget about, you know, uh, there, if you're writing religious fiction, don't forget to go to churches. You know, uh, people who are very senior in churches often are very knowledgeable if they've gone to seminary and so forth. And don't forget your local university. You'll also find lots of information there. So those are the places I recommend to go to for research. Well, I think as far as being rigid, I like historical novels that are really focused well on fact, but it is a matter of how much we emphasize something. We don't want to have a lecture on everything going on in the background, but I think the the trick is always to take the story forward with the characters and make that interesting enough that you get you get a sense of what background you need as you go. That is, you know, if someone is writing in a carriage in Europe in pre-modern times, what would that person see as, as the carriage goes down the road? And that can help bring out a lot of other facts that you really need to convey. But it's best to show it through the viewpoints of the main characters. Research is the boon and the bane of all historical authors. Um, we do a lot of research. I do about 50% 50, 50 of my time writing as research. It's like going down the rabbit hole. You go down and you find information. When I start a book, I begin with the 
the research so that I have a foundation. I know more about where things are. I want my readers to feel like they're transported in time, that they are landing in that street in London or San Francisco in 1884, 1886. What does the street sound like? What does it look like? What does it smell like? I mean, there were horses on the street, right? Um, what, what is it all? Of, you know, I want them to know that they are there for the most part. Um, it's, and I want it to be accurate. It's not historical fantasy. It's historical fiction. So I do a lot of research in the, in the form of making sure that I am um, accurate as much as possible. I use maps a lot. For instance, if I've got a character going from point A to point B, then how long does it take them? Sometimes, you know, time is important, especially when there's, you know, bad guys or killers out there. So are they walking? Are they going by horseback, carriage? What's the train line? Is it uphill? Is it mountainous? Is it flat? Um, so I take my, my restored maps that I get from a place in London. They have these wonderful restored maps, Cassini maps. And I overlay them with Google Maps. That does two things. It lets me know what wasn't there, you know, that is today, because I don't want what wasn't there. And then if I need to know the train, I take Google Earth, and I overlay that. So I know if it's uphill or downhill, and I can calculate times and stuff. Um, it, what was really fascinating is I got an email after the first book came out from a reader in Germany who said, oh, I, you know, I, I live near where, you know, one of your scenes took place, and I just wanted to let you know that. I'm going like, oh, no, you know, he's found something that, I, that I've done inaccurately. And he says, the next time you come, I would like to have you, know, you visit. And it's like the next time, I've never been there. But he didn't know the difference in that. So it's like, whew, that was good. And that was, that's what it's all about. Accuracy, letting people know that you know, the woods in what was Prussia that's now Germany uh, are still the same. Uh, I did a lot of Google Earth on that part of the terrain. Um, you know, street, street view, uh, thank goodness for that. A lot of what we do, I could not do if I didn't have the internet, which allows me to do this stuff. I'd have to be actually traveling to, to some of these places. Um, the other thing is that I have combined uh, uh, or collected, I should say, a, a bunch of experts. Uh, I go to a retired commissioner of Scotland Yard when I need to know information about um, something like the uniform. I had a character who was short, and she was turning around, and here is a bobby, a policeman, who's big and tall with a barrel chest. What did she see? So I needed to know what that uniform looked like. And I was able to find out. She turned around, and there was six brass buttons right there. And then she looked up and could see his face. Little details like that. Those are details I could not research ahead of time. But when I'm there, then I, at that scene, then I have to go, and I, I start you know, digging around. And like I said, Cassini maps. I found a wonderful place that has um, original old prints, copyright, public domain. Copyright's important. So I use a lot of those for my frontispieces in my novels. Um, food. Food is another thing. What's trending? Well, in those days, bear stew and turtle soup. Not a cheeseburger in sight. So you have to look for some of those little everyday details. S go into a, to a pub and order something. What was it? What was on the menu? So that, that's what they have to have. Um, I prefer to do research, um, original research, as much as possible. I go to the archives of newspapers. I look up the day, the week of what the headlines were. I'll look at the ads. Ads give you a lot of information. I use city directories. Um, I w uh, had a, a wonderful city directory that I had uh, for San Francisco in 1886. I could look up who's where, where's the, what are their occupations, where do they live, what was their address. All that super information is there. I was working on 1880, 80, 1886, uh, Ties at Bind, and I found this wonderful nugget of information. And I hope this is not a spoiler alert. Shouldn't be. I, I, I was digging down in the rabbit hole, and I found this anonymously published set of letters that had been, you know, sort of put off to the side. And the actual letters written by this particular man who was a character in my book, he, he really lived, and he had been bribing Congress. And these were his letters offering $200,000 to this congressman, 100000 to that congressman. Well, that just turned the entire plot on its ear. And I, it, it was delicious. It was just so delicious. It was wonderful. That said, you cannot 
do information dumps. Now, I don't care if it's historical fiction, and I don't care, you know, if it's current. When you get a lot of information, you can't do a, 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 just pour it out on the reader. That's going to slow down the story. Think Melville's Moby Dick. There's this whole range of whale chapters. It's like, really? I remember reading that in high school and poke my eye out. You could get away with it back in, in Melville's time. Not today. We have a fast pace. Our readers want fast pace. Keep it moving. Don't slow the story down. So unless that little nugget of information that you have to share that you're so thrilled about finding moves the story along, gives nuance, or helps with a plot point, you leave it. just leave it out. Um, we discover so much um, that you wouldn't believe um, the amount of inf information that I have that the reader never sees. It's just, it's just there. So I always remember, and I tell people that are also writing historical fiction, it's historical fiction, not a historical lesson. I am at heart an educator. Um, I really enjoy learning from history. I like learning from people and relationships, and I'm also a parent. And I think about the things that I hoped my children would uh, learn about how to interact with people. So all of my books have that kind of content in them. And I think as a result, they also lend themselves to the classroom. So I don't write my books for the classroom, but I make sure there's enough content in the stories that they can be used in the classroom. Uh, historical fiction is fairly simple and easy in that you've got history and if you're working in that period you can pull that history in into the classroom fairly easily. Um, my background is really social science and public policy so politics, economics, history come very easy to me. So in the Pirate of Panther Bay series you're learning about the American Revolution even though you're in the Caribbean. You're learning about how the colonial powers actually tried to trade off uh, different weaknesses of their opponents and sort of work with their strengths to try and get advantage. You're learning how different classes in society operated. In the third book, which is Calusa Spirits, um, we're, we actually have the characters meeting a, a sort of a, a rogue tribe of the Calusa Indians, which is an old Florida tribe. And we're learning a lot about history. You'll learn a lot about how that, the location of that tribe in South Florida fundamentally shaped the way that Indian culture existed. And then you'll, you'll hear about the contrast and the conflicts from a more European-centric approach and how that creates problems for the characters, but also creates problems for the Indians. Their meeting with the Calusa Indians has a contemporary application because we are continually struggling with issues of race, with issues of ethnicity. How do we define community? How do we define where we are as individuals in our community? And in Calusa Spirits, there's this scene where it's a very contemporary argument, realization, and understanding of place that mirrors very much what happened in history, but still has very much relevance in today's world. And so, I always think about how can we take historical fiction, how we can we take any sort of story and really draw enough out of the themes and the characters to learn more about ourselves and how we live our days day to day.